before Alex Alejandro starts, uh, you might have understood that the, the talk is about airflow. Well, it's about scalable data science, but it's not about airflow. So uh, if you absolutely want airflow, it's not the right place. Awesome. Can you guys hear me at the back? Uh, I'll still wait a few wait, minutes. Uh, Sorry, man. Should I? Yeah? yeah. Awesome. All right. Cool. <sighs> Hello, guys. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, today, I'm going to be giving a presentation on scalable data science and mainly the state of uh, data ops and more specifically uh, machine learning operations in 2018. 
Uh, a bit about myself, uh, I am the head of solutions engineering at this company called Eigen Technologies. I'm also the chairman at a think tank called the Institute for Ethical uh, Machine Learning. And I'm involved in several other um, groups as an advisor or member. Just to tell you a bit more about Eigen, uh, we build front office, back office automation systems mainly on uh, probabilistic models um, for text analysis mainly. Um, we work uh, primarily in finance, uh, insurance, legal, and we recently raised a, a, a capital round um, for which we're expanding both uh, internationally and within our R&D. So shameless plug, we are hiring. Check it out on eigentech.com. Um, but today, uh, we're going to be doing a deep dive on uh, just scalable data science and what it takes to scale your, the, the function as it is and the challenges that we face. I'm going to mainly cover motivations, concepts, and existing tools. And you can find the slides at uh, bit.ly slash scalable uh, data science or on, uh, not on caps, because otherwise it's not going to work. And yeah, let's do this. Let's jump right into it. In terms of motivations, um, you know, data science, you probably have seen this flow many, many times, but often it can just be broken down uh, very, very generally in two main points. This is the actual model development and uh, the prediction using the model you created. Uh, the development of the model would consist of, you know, ingesting your, your data, doing some data cleaning processes, pre-processing, uh, doing some feature engineering, and then doing your model selection, and of course, iterating until you're happy. Uh, once you're happy, you persist your model, and then you can go into uh, what consists of using and serving the model itself. Uh, new data comes in, uh, you process the data after you transform it, and then you get your results, right? This is very, very simplified, but often you see these two main workflows um, when interacting with a, with a production system. Um, we also uh, we know that in a smaller number, uh, in a, sm a smaller team of data scientists, uh, we tend to, f to face <coughs> smaller number of, of issues. You know, there's less number of models to maintain. Uh, the data scientists, you know, they can have the knowledge on, on their minds, and that is okay. And each have their own way of tracking their progress. So it all works relatively okay. However, as your data science function grows and you start having many more models, many more data scientists, many more data engineers, you start facing new issues, right? So these issues may include an increase of complexity in the flow of the data itself. So this is large number of, of data processing workflows, uh, complexity on the order in which they should be executed, complexity in the way that uh, the failover processes should be executed, um, and also on the managing the, the complexity uh, of that, you know, you don't want to end up with just like a crazy cron tab um, that you know is your biggest nightmare. Uh, also, each data scientist has their own set of tools. You know, some love TensorFlow, some love R, Spark, and good luck trying to make sure that you know each person sticks towards just one specific thing, especially with the grand variety of things that are actually necessary to be uh, doing what both in analysis, prediction, etc. Serving models, because of these uh, reasons, uh, also becomes more complex. So you have different models running in different environments. You have a lot of deployments and reverting that have to actually be managed and automated. But if you just have like one person dealing with this, that would be really, really you know, hard. Um, and also, when stuff goes wrong, you know, it's really hard to trace back. Right, you have situations where you know data scientists are going to try to blame the data engineers. The data engineers is like, no, it's your model, and it becomes like a cat and mouse um, game. So, you know, there's no traceability and reproducibility to see, you know, what went wrong to actually debug it. Lucky for us, or I don't know if lucky, but everybody or a lot of people are facing this problem at this point in time, and it's actually something that many people are trying to address in industry to the to the point that actually there's starting to be even new roles coming out to actually address this specific problem. So you've had the data scientists, the data engineers, but also now you start having like this DevOps, data ops, ML ops engineers that are interacting with this prioritization of models and data pipelines. So let's, let's dig deeper into the actual understanding and the concepts of this, of this area. Um, so as your technical function grows, um, you see that you know, these workflows, even though they still exist in um, you know, the next iterations and, and as your technical teams grow, um, they grow in complexity, right? So there is a new layer that is required to allow you to grow and scale these this two main workflows that you would normally have. And this, in this talk at least, I'm going to refer to it as just the operations for your machine learning itself. 
And more specifically, I want to focus on what I want to break down on this talk as two main principles towards machine learning operations. This would be the first one of reproducibility and the second one of orchestration. More specifically, um, you know, on reproducibility is model uh, and data versioning, or the concept of it, as well as the second one for orchestration is deployment orchestration, monitoring, etc. Um, and you know, if we break down these two principles, uh, specifically with the first one, the model data versioning, you have it interacting in both the, the actual development of your model and the serving of your model. But often what you want to do is you want to make sure that your end-to-end -end, um, development and your, uh, uh, your progress can be reproducible, right? Like you can go back and know what happened, when it happened, how can you rerun it, and you still have the same results. And if you actually break it down in each of these individual atomic steps, you actually get into a point where every single step has you know, some very generic uh, similarities, right? All of them have some data coming in, some stuff happening in the middle, and some data coming out. If we actually dive deep into, into the steps themselves, we can actually abstract the individual steps and make sure that we have an atomic isolated you know, computation that can be reproduced wherever we are. Right? As long as we have the, the, this, these four key things, which is uh, the data that is coming in, the code that is going to process it, the configuration required for that code to you know, run in the same terms, and then the output of the data. This in itself allows us to just really freeze what it would be in terms of our processing. And if we take one, one level higher, um, we would be able to not just have the, the, the uh, individual atomic uh, steps and operations, but we would be able to actually understand uh, for each of the steps that are required to create, you know, in this case, what would be a, a specific model at a, a specific point in time and a state. Right? In this case, we may have uh, several steps that are doing data cleaning, some steps that are doing feature engineering, and then the data goes into the model and you get some results. Each of these steps would have a specific input and a specific output. If we have everything that um, you know, is stated, we, we can replicate it. Right? And this is basically you know, the age-old question of reproducibility itself in data science. Um, and you know, this, this would, if, we, if we can attain it, it would get us closer to be able to go back and rerun stuff and get the same results. And reproducibility is, is very important because it en enables us to do a lot of things like traceability when debugging for errors, transparency on the steps that were carried out to lead the results, whether it's for compliance or just for reassessment, modularity of the components for reusability to be able to know that this will always give you the specific output or it will do always a specific thing, uh, and also abstraction for support of multiple different libraries and the robustness, um, you know, if we require to go back into a previous release, we can actually know where we are at each point in time and roll back when necessary. Um, and once we have the internal representations in our models, then we can actually like also serve them in production, right? We, we have a way of storing them and also about serving them. And that's when we jump on the second principle, which is model deployment orchestration. And this covers mainly the complexities of serving machine learning models in production. So this is actually resembling somehow to the continuous integration, continuous development, uh, or monitoring for uh, software that you would normally interact with, but it's also completely different. Um, one one uh, good definition that I saw uh, um, from Andres Carpati uh, was in, in, in his definition of software 2.0, uh, aka machine learning, where he uh, makes the difference of traditional software development, where you would actually just code the, 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 the software itself. Here you would uh, follow this kind of like three-step process where you start by defining what is the goal of the behavior. So this could be things as abstract of like win, win a game of Go or satisfy a data set of input, output, pairs of examples. Then instead of actually writing the entire code, you would write what could be seen very abstractly as a rough skeleton of the code. This would be some flexible model that, you know, as he puts it, uh, if you imagine all of the possible, uh, you know, uh, possibilities of, of a, a specific program, you know, you choose a specific subset of that space and you use the computational resources at your disposal to search for uh, that space for a program that would do what you expect it to do. Right? And because of this uh, very, very abstract definition, you know, we actually face a different uh, kind of um, system that what you would do with some deterministic, even though we still be deterministic, but, but some usual typical um, piece of software. So all of these different monitoring, uh, deployment, uh, continuous integration um, paradigms that you would normally use and see in software development would actually differ. And let's jump and see what, how they are different uh, in one way or another. Um, in terms of monitoring, um, if you're actually assessing how a machine learning model is performing, you have to go beyond the debug logs. 
And what this means is that you need to actually monitor your, your model as soon as you deploy it in a short-term base and also on a long-term base. In the short-term perspective, you want to make sure that you know there are no anomalies, right? Like if you actually train the model to um, predict the specific range, you want to make sure that it's not outside of this or it's not a negative number or something like that. You also want to monitor for bias. You want to make sure that uh, the new model that you're actually deploying is not skewed towards a specific you know, prediction in, in, in a bad way. And with that, you want to actually compare it objectively to the previous version that you had actually deployed. So it's important to be able to monitor your models in, in, in more ways than just checking the logs as you would with software when debugging them. And in the long term, you want to also monitor for errors. You want to you check for all outages, for performance, longer term performance as you get more labeled data to be able to compute, to compare it, and to improve it. Right? So it's, it's, it's still necessary to have the, moni the, the monitoring piece, but it would be a different paradigm to what you would do with software. Um, quality control as well, the, the processes in production, it's necessary that they are specific to your use case. And this is something like your monitoring, for example, can be specific to the, the outputs that you require. You know, you may focus more on, on, ha on minimizing the, the amount of false positives or maybe minimizing the amount of like, false negatives. Like, depending on what your use case is, the monitoring will also be specific to that. Compliance is the second thing. So this is basically surrounding the questions of what happened, when it happened, how, why it happened, how it happened. And it's a boring word, but you know, it has a lot of exciting benefits. Uh, and mainly, you, know, you can actually move into praying for yourself were to work in production to going into a more pragmatic you know uh, uh, um, set of steps that allow you to understand and, and, and isolate each of the, the the steps that you would normally take into your data science process and, and, and moving it to production as well and there's a very good talk that I'm linking here uh, from the, the developers from Pachyderm that they talk about compliant machine learning definitely recommend you guys to check that and this enables data scientists, data engineers, and uh, you know, data ops engineers to be able to track back issues, debug the problems, and avoid this cat and mouse game when something goes wrong, they can actually go back and check, reproduce, and you know, be able to revert back if necessary. Um, in terms of compu uh, the, the computational side, there's also a challenge when it comes to resource allocation, making sure that your systems have the right uh, resources allocated, right? Whether this is about data, about RAM, about GPUs, there is, this is a very often complex uh, problem because you have computational graphs in the order that this has to be executed. You have to have the right these resources. And look, this is, a, this is a very hard problem, right? Like this is pretty much building an operating system kernel where the physical resources are you know, completely distributed. You may have some, some of them failing and you need to have the failovers. And the software itself, you know, this is your, your ETL framework, your data pipeline framework, or your HDFS based system, or, or your Kubernetes cluster, right? So you have all of this physical infrastructure and you want to be able to manage your resources to be able to allocate it to, to the jobs that are requesting it. And this is, this is a really hard problem, but it is one that people are tackling. And this is important, you know, in one of the talks from um, some, some of the guys from Algorithmia, um, they were talking about how you would, you know, s like spend in terms of resources to be able to service um, your, your infrastructure with a traditional sense of just, you know, allocating it fully. Uh, to make sure that you're ready for like you know the maximum number of calls, you know this is very inefficient. You would you know ramp up like a massive massive bill, um, and then you move into auto scaling, right? Auto scaling, you you provision more more uh, servers once you uh, see more traffic coming in. So then you know you're able to optimize slightly for the amount of usage, right? But but then you still have a little bit of a cost um, on the on the on the calls that that are coming in as you prepare to ramp up. And then you have the, the, the last one, which you know, right now is it's, it's really hot at the moment, which is serverless, which you only use the amount that you need to use. And you know, I'm not saying that you, know, you should just go to serverless, but uh, I'm saying that you know, it's important to make sure that you have your resource allocation and you're conscious that you know, this is a challenge that is now becoming more and more necessary. So now what's next? Um, right now, I actually want to jump in and have a look at some of the solutions that are out there, because there are many people that are trying to tackle this. And there are some actually pretty awesome existing tools. I myself uh, have, a, have a blog as well, um, putting together a, a one of the awesome lists specifically for machine learning operations. Uh, you know, please jump in, chip in, uh, contribute. If you have any that I don't mention, you know, do just jump in. It's very early stage, but you know, I want to really dive into this because it's a very, very interesting uh, space. 
Uh, the, uh, starting with the first principle of reproducibility, uh, or model and data versioning, I want to start from the very, very, very bottom. And this is basically on your standards, right? It's basically the question of how do you store your models, right? How do you serialize them? How do you represent them? And you know, one of the standards that is out there uh, that is actually um, you know, rel relatively old is, is uh, PMML. Uh, which is just an XML format and a standard for you to be able to represent your machine learning models. And this is basically it, right? It's nothing exciting, but it's just a way for you to be able to like store um, your compiled models or trained models in a way that is like you know in an XML format. And you know there there is um, a, a way to uh, interact with, for example, scikit-learn um, uh, models. Once you tr once you actually create your, your your model, you can export it into just like a PMML file. And this for the, having a standard format is good because this allows you to import export models across other um, systems, whether it's like Spark ML or you know, if you create your own data science library, you can actually you know interface into into a standard that's already out there. Um, there is this other tool called uh, Data Version Control (DVC). Uh, very very interesting, uh, other, uh, different approach. This basically was a fork of Git. Uh, it was built by this company called Iterative AI that allows for you know basically just taking a, a, a version control type of approach to managing these four key things, well, three key things, which is code, data in, and, and model out or data out. Um, very interesting approach. What you, what you normally do, very similar to what you would do with Git, you would add a specific um, piece of data into your repository. Uh, you would then run um, or hit the run command, which basically connects the actual input data with the code that you want to run and the model itself that your output uh, that you're generating as an output, um, then you basically can select a repository to be able to store everything. In this case, we're selecting S3, and then you're able to just basically push it. Um, uh, another another approach that um, I actually find very very interesting and one of the most interesting ones is this one called ModelDB. ModelDB is basically a more implicit way of tracking how you interact with your models. And this is more focused on the development of the models, on, on the more research or, or you know, data science iterative uh, approach that you would normally take trying to you know, do feature engineering. And what, the way that it basically works is it extends some of the functions within the libraries. So instead of having like your, your you know, fit and predict sort of stuff, I actually forgot to make some changes in this slide. But um, you know, you would just fit your data, and then you would run, run your prediction. You would instead just run um, the underscore sync uh, functions. And what this basically does is this literally just tracks the stuff that goes inside of the functions and the output, the returns that you have, and it stores them in a database that basically allows. Uh, well, the internet doesn't allow, but uh, what you would be able to see if it allowed is basically uh, a way to actually search in your. Um, you know, store of all of the iterations that you've run. So if you try to, to run uh, an SVM with multiple different parameters and different features, you would be able to see how it performed in terms of accuracy, for example, um, and be able to like search on what was given at, at each point of time. So very, very interesting approach, very implicit. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting way of like dealing with it. So I would actually recommend for you guys to check out some of these projects and you know, see what works best for you. Another, another approach that is also very interesting is this project called Pachyderm. So Pachyderm is an end-to-end -end model versioning uh, framework um, that also allows you to uh, basically define your, your uh, computational graphs as well as storing the changes of your data as, as you go. So it's a combination, I would say, of like you know, data version control with you know, the ability to define the computational graphs. So Pachyderm, I'm actually going to run you to some code examples. Uh, they're basically data repositories. Um, it consists of three key things. So these are data repositories, uh, the actual processing steps uh, that are wrapped into Docker containers. So this is basically the code and configuration part of it. And then the pipeline that basically c connects the order of computation, uh, each step containing an input and an output. So an example, let's build you know, an iris classifier using an, an SVM from scikit-learn and outputting a trained model. What you would do is you would basically start by creating a repo. This is where you store um, data. You would, once you create a repo, you can put, like in this case, like our training data into, the, into this repo, because you want to store the data that you know, is coming into your model, and then you store what, what is out. So this is how it, how it manages it. Once you have your repo, you basically just like Dockerize your code, right? And the code basically what it what is able to do, it get, it gives it an input folder and then an output folder. So in this case, it's always like PFS slash the repo that we created that we called training, 
then it would take that input and use the data, and then it would put the model pickled in the output uh, in the same repo itself. Right, so we're basically here just specifying what is the code that we want to do. So we specify the data, uh, we specify the code, and now we specify the computational pipeline. This just basically says, use that image that we created, the configuration and the code, um, and run it in this repo, right? And it just basically does, does that. Uh, what we end with is like a snapshot of this you know, input which was created with our, with our repo, the, the training data, the model itself, the config, and then the output, which was the model itself. Right, so we have basically a reproducible you know, atomic you know, computational graph with a storage of the input and the outputs that then we can assess, rep like rerun, et cetera, et cetera. And the second principle on the orchestration, we have a few tools. One of them, MLEAP, a uh, very interesting tool that goes actually one level deeper into serialization of models. So it's not just like the, the PMML that I showed that is just a standard. They actually provide a computational engine to be able to run this, these models themselves. So you can actually um, you know, take already created models from TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, or Spark, and then you're able to run them in their engine. Um, into one s in, in one single format, right? So this is really good if you want to manage your deployment, and it's very easy to interact. You basically uh, just have to take your model file, and you can like serve it, and then you just interact with the model itself. Um, and the model basically it's actually stored in a, in a in a JSON serialized format, right? So it basically just specifies all of the features, all, all, all of the transformations that had that had to go to it uh, in order for you to store the model and then to run it. Um, and then the last one that I'm going to cover today is Seldon Core. Again, this focuses on the actual uh, orchestration, right? So you have all of the you know, data analysis, data validation, iterating on your model, but then you have the rollout, serving, monitoring, and optimization. This focuses on this, on this specific side. Um, it focuses mainly on you know, the three steps of package your, 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 your code in a Docker repo, describe the deployment or the graph or how you want it to be deployed, and then just like push it into what you know this uses is basically Kubeflow from Kubernetes. Um, it has two main projects. One is focused on the runtime ML graph that is open source, and then they provide the actual monitoring as an enterprise product. But very very interesting, and they actually do tackle a lot of very interesting you know uh, challenges like the concept of you know CI CD for your model development, right? Where you have your your Kubernetes instance where you have where you're, where you're running Seldon Core or your deployment framework, um, uh, your, your model orchestration production framework or development framework, and you basically automate as your data scientists create a new model, they can just basically very easily deploy it, assess it, monitor it, et cetera, et cetera, what it, whatever is required. But basically very interesting flow that they actually propose when, when you know, dealing with your data science development flow. Um, and of course, they use uh, Grafana for the monitoring side. You're able to just like you know see all of the inputs outputs that are that that you know are going on, and you can actually trace back of what you know your your production system is is doing. Um, you know, us at Eigen, we actually take a, a different approach. We don't really use any of this uh, of these tools, even though you know I personally do think they're pretty awesome. We have actually built all of the parts of our infrastructure. So we built a nightly uh, accuracy monitoring framework uh, that has been very, very useful. Our internal JSON standards for metadata representation of the models themselves. Uh, we've built our di distributed manager worker uh, 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 execution framework with RabbitMQ, um, our generalized um, um, abstraction layer above all of the libraries that we use. And I would say you know, the, the, the machine learning pipeline that we're currently developing is, is, is pretty interesting. Uh, then an SDK to extend it, uh, and then an end-to-end -end data pipeline framework. Um, but basically, I mean, we, we have been building our own. You know, it's like typical engineering mentality of like, you know, we have this very specific use case, we're just going to go and build it ourselves. Um, but, but yeah, we have some very interesting stuff in-house. And you know, what about you guys? I mean, for you guys, today we covered, uh, you know, concepts on scalable data science, uh, mainly around motivations. Uh, existing tools. Again, the slides you can find find them at bit.ly slash awesome MLOps. Um, well, both the the, um, the MLOps list and the scalable data science. So feel free to jump in, contribute. And again, thank you very much, guys. Very much appreciated. Um, happy to take any questions if we have some time.
Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, I have worked for more than 20 years in the bank of, in the IT of a bank. And uh, I think that the first part of, the, of, your, of your talk is just about uh, good practices in IT operations. Exactly. Uh, which are covered by uh, ISO 20000, for example. Uh, and uh, the second part was more about specific tools for, for ML. But I think that uh, we should not forget that data science r r rests on IT. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I think I think for me that is an interesting part because when I was putting together this presentation, you know, I came back to you know very very fundamental concepts of software development um, that you know within even data science relying in the infrastructure it goes back into you know best practices on infrastructure management um, and you know yeah we go, we go to first practice fundamentals uh, which I, I find super interesting. Any question? Awesome. Well, questions at the pub, if anyone has more. Thank you very much. Awesome. Cool. Thank you very much. I'll just turn it off. <laughs>
usually it works. But with your eyes, it's strange, yeah. Uh, yeah. You need FME. Even without FME. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So, five minutes before the end, I will, yeah. I will make you mm -hmm. sign. Then two minutes. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Fine. So this talk will be a bit about uh, my background and my, uh, my ongoing research in relation to Python and, 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 and our, our ongoing projects. So first, a little bit about me. I am from Stockholm, Sweden. I'm a professor of theoretical chemistry working at KTH. I'm involved in the software carpentry, data carpentry groups. I'm a co-editor of the sci-fi lecture notes, so uh, there's going to be some talk about that uh, during the lightning talks by Gael, so make sure you see that. And I teach Python at different levels at our university. So this is about <coughs> computational chemistry, or theoretical chemistry. So, so what is that? It can mean a lot of things, so th this covers a whole field. You want to study things like molecules, mat matter, theoretically. You can do it at a lot of different levels, at different time scales, different length scales, and you have different mathematical models for, for different types of situations. So you can use the quantum mechanics, you can use uh, classical mechanics, uh, and you can use a combination of the two. So, so this, this is a model that was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry a few years ago. Uh, but I'm uh, mostly involved in this corner, so I, I study electronic structure of molecules and, and try to predict mathematically uh, structure and properties of, of chemical interest. So what it's often was down to in practice, what we do with our computers is to solve equations like this. So this can be either be large eigenvalue equations or very large linear systems of equations. Uh, dimensions that ve can vary depending on, on the size of the problem or the accuracy you want to achieve. But, but a typical dimension for these types of equations is, is, is one million. So that means that a matrix like that cannot be uh, stored in memory because you have one million by one million. That's a tera, tera word, eight, couple of eight terabytes. Uh, so these equations are typically solved in an iterative fashion where you project, you project the equation onto a reduced south space. And, and and, and that cell space in, is uh, increased in each iteration. Nevertheless, we have some, some rule governing the multiplication of, of some, some kind of matrix and a vector, and, and that is uh, and there, this is the time-consuming part in the calculations. There's a lot of things going underneath. You get all contributions from how electrons and nuclei interact and move, that kind of thing. A solution to an eigenvalue equation can, can correspond to, to some kind of experiment like this, uh, a spectrum where you, where you want to uh, shine a light on a molecule and you want to know the probability for absorption at different frequencies. So, so the eigenvalues of that equation can correspond to excitation frequencies in a molecule. So 
So there's, you need some software for this, and, and uh, I started out already as a PhD student with, with this program called Dalton, and it's uh, so rather old now. It's, it's uh, started out in the 80s, and you have a lot of Fortran code, what you would today call a legacy code. Uh, there's some newer editions of C and C++, but, 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 but it's, it's quite large now, typically a mil over a million uh, lines of code. And, and it was uh, made open source a few years ago. Okay. So this is, uh, has been, uh, over the years, been a Scandinavian uh, collaboration project, quite successful considering the, the time it has been going on and, and the people involved. Uh, but there has not been any clear plan for how it should develop. It has grown organically over all these years, and, and typically students come and go, and uh, they add some layer of complexity because they are studying some specific project at that point in time, and you get a new piece of code. Uh, so it's not easy to, to maintain or direct this kind of project. Uh, so, the main problems is that there are no unit tests. Uh, 30 years ago, nobody knew what a unit test was, and, and in Fortran, there is not a, any good support for that kind of work. Yet. Uh, there are a, long, a number of end-to-end -end tests, so, you, so you, know some, you have some reference problems, you know what the result should be, and you can sort of monitor that the results of a given calculation does not change over time. But the main problem is that, that a code like this is difficult to modify. Uh, everything is connected to everything, so if you break or change something over there, something might break on the other end, and, and you never know what happens. Very difficult to maintain. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, I think this is a very nice book about legacy codes. Uh, I, 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 I could recognize a lot of things uh, in common with our project. Nevertheless, uh, there's a lot of man years invested in the code, so, and there's a lot of obscure functionality that nobody will rewrite in a, in a, in a modern way or re-implement. Uh, so, so the code will hang around, it will not go away, but and in some aspects it's still okay. It's, it's, um, it's nice for teaching and, and, and doing small scale things. Now we have in our department uh, some new development on the way. Uh, it's not there yet, but, but But rather soon we have something to, something to publish, I think. So this will mostly be uh, new C++ implementations uh, of, of the most interesting parts of these functionalities. And, and they use parallelism <coughs> over MPI, so, so that is the these are the standards we have to use in, 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 in HPC centers, MPI, OpenMP, and, and CUDA. And now we're considering uh, Pythonizing the project and, and sort of have a Python abstraction layer on top. And uh, uh, so that, so that uh, Python acts both as a glue and a way of governing how these different modules uh, interact and how we exchange data between different modules. Okay. <coughs> so, so we can consider the Python level, Python framework at different levels. So, so, so at, at, at the topmost level, well, if you consider that this old monolithic code, we use Python as glue, that's quite easy to fix. You can use it to generate input files, run the calculations in a traditional way, and then you can get data back 
from the output files. Uh, now we're also considering MPI for at sort of intermediate level. So we manage the, the, the MPI from Python and distribute tasks to different parts of the other program. So for instance, we can split the MPI communicator over different computational parts that, that, that have different properties regarding scaling. Uh, we have some, this is an hello world type of example of how this works. Uh, and the top frame, we have Python, we import from MPI for Pi. Uh, and, and this uh, MPI standard has a function called split, which allows you to split an MPI communicator <laughs> in, in, in order to, to uh, divide uh, task to, su to sub-processes. And this is another example. Now we have uh, some Python, and this is some Fortran. <coughs> so <coughs> everything runs from the Python layer. We have, uh, we have an MPI communicator. And this is now a Fortran code that we compile with the, with the F2 Py compiler from the NumPy package. So that gives you a, a module that Python can import. And that is done at this second source line. So we import this compiled Fortran module. Uh, and then there's a functionality for converting the, the communicator uh, at the Python level to some kind of object that is recognized by Fortran. So, so this is the Fortran communicator, which is passed to the say hello function. And that goes in here, and then th things will look the same as we would run the Fortran code uh, in a normal way. So the way you, you run this thing, this example, you use the MPI run number of processors, and, and then you have Python as the main program. And then the hello.py as, as the argument, which is run in parallel. Okay, so this is what I can say in about 15 minutes. So this is ongoing work. Uh, we're looking at Python as a glue between different compiled codes, so, so we can ha have sort of a, could have for instance, a, a Fortran module and, and a C++ module running in parallel at the same time. Uh, for the C++ part, we, f we have found that, that Boost is a promising library for this kind of interaction. And Fortran, we have F2.5. And uh, testing is important. So we, use, uh, we have a combination of PyTest and, and the Google unit testing for the C++ part. And uh, that concludes my talk. So, just in time, so I can take some questions. Thank you, Olaf. Is there any any question? Okay. Thank you very much.
Ew. Yeah. Okay, I will. Yes. Oh. It's yours. It's all five minutes and two minutes. Okay. I start? Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Yannick and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about this Python library I've been creating over the last two, one and a half years called Parcelmouth. And so to start with a little bit of background, I'm a PhD student at the Vrije Universiteit Brussel's Artificial Intelligence Lab and at the University of Antwerp. And the topic of my uh, PhD is to apply pattern mining to speech. So the thing is, speech is this, well, it's obviously structured if you look at these spectrograms. So here is the different frequencies that evolve over time. And uh, you can clearly see that between plays, play, A's, th th there's some commonalities there, right? Especially if you look at that S, that looks twice, almost the same, but every time it's slightly different. And so children learn to group these sounds together, yet, well, computers are still not very good at this because children do this in a very short time. Uh, and they also do this in with a limited amount of data compared to deep learning method. But anyway, before I can apply these algorithms, I need to pre-process the speech a little bit and I want to extract some acoustic features. And maybe I even want to do that during some algorithm, but the thing is, this data, this speech data is, is quite complex. These algorithms are also complex and there's lots of different variants of the algorithm and, and I don't want to re-implement those myself. Now luckily there's this library called Prat or software package called Prat and Prat, which means to talk in Dutch, uh, is widely used actually in language sciences, is taught to students in linguistics and can do lots of the things I want to do, like analyzing in the intensity, analyzing the tone height of some sound. We can also do lots of other stuff. So if you're interested in those kind of things, checking out the website of Prat is a good idea. Also, Prat has some scripting language built in to automate stuff. Now, this is how that looks. And then in the script, this would be the rest. And then if you look at this, there's like a few things I don't like as a computer scientist with my background. First of all, the actions, the functions you call are literally the text that's in the user interface. And second of all, you can see this like select object pitch and then, and then at that point you get the value at time. And so the thing is, this is emulating the user interface, this is what you would do in in this user interface earlier, you would select something, and then you would click the button. And if I see that, well, and then maybe the most important problem, in my opinion, is that it's completely separate from the rest of the Python ecosystem that I like, that I know, that I want to use. Uh, you can, of course, write to files. You can read from files. but but. Or you could even make a sub-process call from Python. But, but if I see this, I think, no, I want to do this in Python. And so, well, long, so, long story short, I'm quite stubborn. And I started creating a library wrapping around this functionality such that you can now write that same script in Python syntax, but still call into Parcelmouth, into the Prat library, to do these operations that are so complex. And so the main idea for Parcelmouth is can I create a Python library for Prat? But at the same time, that feels like Python that really like merges with the rest of the ecosystem. Yet at the same time, I want it to be efficient and I don't want to, well, I also have some research to do sometimes. And uh, sometimes. And uh, so the good news is that the Prat source code is available on GitHub. Uh, and there is this, well, Python C API uh, that allows you to link existing C code to Python. Moreover, there's PyBind, and PyBind is a C++ wrapper around this that gets rid of some of the low-level, uh, yeah, the low-level overhead that you need to do in, in the C API, such as uh, reference counting, or, for example, PyBind also allows to 
infer the type of the argument so you don't have to, the type of the arguments to a function if you're exposing a function. And so they have really good documentation. So if you're interested in that, also check out their website. And of course, I know there's some other options as well there. We've had a great tutorial about that two days ago. So why did I use PyBind 11? First of all, in any case, I want to reuse this existing code. As I said before, I'm not going to re-implement that in Python. But at the same time, I realized that a C++ interface is not a good C++ interface. is not per se a good Python interface. In Python, we want to work at a slightly higher level. We want to do things that feel Pythonic, as we would call them. And there's some silly things, but, but like a camel case, no, you, don't, you, you want to convert that to underscores because all the rest of the libraries are using that. And, you, and, and maybe the C integer that is given to this function, actually that's being used as a Boolean, or maybe that's a, those are a few values that are actually enumeration values. So in Python, you want that to be constants of an enumeration. Or this separate loose standing function, actually that's maybe a method of a class. And so PyBind allows you to do that, and at the same time, uh, tweak the interface and make it more Pythonic uh, without having to write some binding code for C, and then another layer around that in Python. Uh, furthermore, that is already written in C++11, so I need to use C++ anyway. Uh, furthermore, PyBind has built-in support for NumPy arrays, and I am quite a fan of the C++ templates. And so how does this look then? For example, you have this function, get energy in air. On the C++ side, you say, expose that as get energy in air. And on the Python side, you have a, a sound object, and you can say, get energy in air. You can do something slightly more complicated and say, get number of samples. Oh, well, number of samples is actually on the C++ side. That's an attribute. So let's expose that with a, with a new C++ Lambda. Or actually, in Python, the, the more obvious thing to do is to access that as, also access that as an attribute. But you don't want people to be able to set that, because then your C code will go out of bounds. So you can expose a read-only property. And uh, you can el also just expose yet another property, saying the sampling frequency. But if someone changes the sampling frequency, that's not just a number. Some other things are also going to change. The length of, of my sound object is also going to change. And then you can, instead of calling functions, you can, you can use a more high level that, that will actually call into the right function. And the part I might like the most even is the fact that you can expose values of a matrix object, you can return uh, an, array, an array object. And at that point, you can just use NumPy. Like, you can use the fancy indexing. You can use factorized operations on that. On that data that is there and that is not being copied, but that is exposed in a very Python way. And so the moment you have that, you can do, well, you can start combining parcel mode, the path functionality with the rest of that ecosystem we all know. And you can start reading in a sound, extracting part of that sound, getting the values of that, that wave, of that sound wave, and plot that sound wave. Now, I know plotting a sound wave is not specifically hard. I think there's even a, a wave library in Python. But then calculating the spectrogram with these specific Pratt parameters, right? We're, we're, we're getting the same output as you would get in Pratt, because this is kind of a standard, well, unofficially, but it's kind of a standard library that's being used in language size. So we're getting the, those same values. Uh, we're also estimating the pitch here. Uh, but we're plotting them in, in, in Matplotlib in this case, in, in Plotly, in Bokeh, if you want. Uh, you can, well, it's up to you, right? And. Uh, Using Pratt, you can even do something more. I can show you the documentation. You can, for example, use Pratt to uh, change the pitch of a of an uh, of, of of a sound file. And well, let me demonstrate this. Bye. Bye. So you can have your colleague say four, for example. Four. 
Is that clear? Where is the uh, it, yeah, it's here on the side. Four. And then using that path code, but at the same time use it using all the Python because this is this is a nice Jupyter notebook that is converted to documentation. You can increase the pitch by an octave and have this. Four. This is just one of the, 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 the things that sound nice to do. And I you can even expose this through binder if binder will work. Okay, well, let's get back to this at the end if there's still time left. Anyway, uh, yes, five minutes, okay. Uh, so, well, check out, I have some examples that are all Jupyter Notebooks. And so, that's the technical part, and then there's everything else, and there's like, oh yeah, now, now it's solved. Well, there's still a few more things to do. First of all, part of the user base are people in language sciences, and they're not particularly fond of doing anything with programming. It's more a tool than, than actually something they enjoy. Well, maybe, well, if you're focusing on research, you want things to be quick and easy anyway. So this needs to be easily installable. But you have this big C++ program uh, that needs to be used from the Python side. So I'm building binary wheels on Travis CI and AppFair such that they can easily be installed through this binary wheel standard. And CI build wheel has been helping me to like, build this for all different Python versions. So if you have a similar problem, that might be interesting for you as well. Furthermore, apparently it's pretty easy to mess up things on a Mac to have like different Python versions installed and not know which Python you're actually running. So I added something to the, Py to the, to the documentation such that it's, again, easily installable if you don't really know what environment you're in. Uh, next, it's never a good idea, but especially in this case, it's not a good idea to just throw an API reference and say, hey, you can figure it out, it, it makes sense. No, you, you need some nice examples, and the Jupyter notebooks that get converted in documentation, I think, are, are quite nice for that, because at the same time, you can never run them. I've also found Gitter. There's this chat box linked to a, a, a GitHub repository. I found it really useful because at the, at the one end, it, it reduces the threshold for people to actually ask a question. They don't have to send an email or open an issue. And at the same time, you don't get issues that are not issues but are rather questions. So it's, it's, it's a win on both sides. And then finally, together with my supervisor, Bert de Boer, and my colleague, Bill Thompson, we have been successfully writing a manuscript and publishing it in the Journal of Phonetics, presenting this to the language sciences. But turns out it's not that easy to actually argue why you wouldn't want to have this Python language. To probably most of you, it's obvious, because you want to combine this with this other library and this other library, and maybe something I haven't even thought of. But it's, it's an acquired skill, let's say, that we think of problems as in I need this functionality, oh, I'll use that library for that, and then I'll link it to this functionality, is some of the reviewers told us, well, you can actually already do this in Pratt if you do this and this, and uh, writing a CSV file, why would you do that through Pandas? You can like, write a CSV file from, from the script there as well. And so, yeah, that's about, I have these, first of all, if anyone is doing something with speech or with sound, it might be an interesting library for you. Second of all, I think wrapping the whole existing C++ code to Python might also be an interesting use case for, for some broader audience. And if none of those are really something you're interested in, then I think it's still nice to have a reminder that decomposing stuff into these different libraries in the Python ecosystem is it's really it's an acquired skill it's something important because you you can do so many more things you can know how to plot independently of what data you have you can know how to apply uh, data mining uh, or, or, or uh, machine learning independently of the data you have. And so if anyone's interested then uh, well come and talk to me I'm happy to talk a bit about this and uh, well Finally, I've been designing a logo, but I'm not a logo designer, so <laughs> the best I've come so far is to, to take one of these comics and put the Pratt logo on top of there. But if anyone has any brilliant ideas, please let me know as well. <laughs> Why 
Well, thank you, Yannick. Uh, questions? Uh, what are the reasons why you didn't use uh, Swig? <laughs> uh, again, because Swig is really nice. It automates stuff. It, it, you only need to give it a header and, and a little bit of code around that. But again, that, that, that C++ or that it's C++ in the first place, but that C++ interface is, is not per se the interface I want to use on the Python side. I want to ask dot values and get a NumPy array there. Yeah, you can, but, but you have to tweak that interface anyway. And I'm comfortable with doing that in C++. And I think PyBind really, if you n like C++ or if you're not afraid of it, really allows you to do that well on, on one side and, and build this small wrapper. Thank you. Any other question? Well, thank, thank you. you. Uh, hello everyone. So, I'll, I'm Ankur, and I'll be talking about explaining our model predictions using shapely values. So, the original idea of shapely values comes from game theory. Uh, so, in this talk, I'll try to introduce the concept of shapely value first, and I'll show how it connects to machine learning, and then I'll be showing a few examples uh, using this library called SHAP. So, so what's the problem statement of shapely values? So, in game theory, we have like this uh, coalition game in which like a few players are playing together for towards some reward. Now, after the game, once the reward is generated, how do we divide the reward amongst the players based on how much they contributed? So you can take this example of, let's say, a football team, where we have like three players and a goalkeeper. And we let them play a game, and the total reward they generated was, let's say, 100. A uh, reward can be anything. like It can be any function where uh, it can be based on like uh, the teams the players played with, or a number of matches they played, and how much they won, and how many they lo lose. So the solution that Shapely Values comes up with is to assume that each of the player is joining one by one. So we start with like a team of a single player and let him play a match, him or her. And we basically see how much reward that that player generated. So let's say in this case, uh, the player generated a reward of 20. So we another add another player to the team now and let that team play a few games. And we see how much total reward was generated. Let's say in this case, it's 35. So the second player here added a reward of 15. So we say that, OK, the second player has a value of 15. The first player had a value of 20. And then we add another player. And let's say that player adds a value of 30. So that's how we divide the value to each pair. But if you see here, there's a problem with this method. The problem is that uh, the reward, the value of each player depends on the order in which they are added. 
So for example, here we have a player uh, with a total value of 20, and we add a goalkeeper with a value of 30. But what happens if we add another goalkeeper to the team? That goalkeeper will be almost be useless because there's no point of having two goalkeepers in a football team. So that goalkeeper will add a very small value. But if you think about the situation where G2 was added before G1, that player would have rather added a value of 30 rather than 5. So the method, this method has a problem of ordering. So, so the solution to this, according to Shapley value, is to, let's say we consider all the possible orderings of players that we can add. And for each of those possible orderings, we compute the value of each player. And then we average on that and say, OK, that's the value that each player adds to the game. So for this specific example, the last one, we'll have like these six possible orderings of uh, players. And for each player, we compute how much the value is added and average over that. So the formula below is for the value of player i given a function v, which is the reward function. I'll explain this formula in the next slide. So yeah, so we are trying to compute the value added by uh, by the player i, given a reward function v. Uh, the summation is over all possible subsets of the total number of players. So you can think of this as basically having all the players which are being added to the team before the player i is added. So it can be s can be like a single player, like different sets of single players, sets of two players, sets of three players. And now once we have that, so that will basically fix the order where the summation will basically fix the order where the ith player is being added. So once that we have that, uh, there's a property here that you can see. Uh, so if you think about, uh, if you fix the position of player g2 to be last, no matter at what point p1 or g1 joins the team, it doesn't matter on the value of g2, because you can reverse p1 and g1. And the value before G2 is added is still going to be the same as if it was first G1 came and after that P1 came. So this term here basically takes care of this thing, that uh, it basically computes all the possible orders of players to be added before the ith player is being added. The other property is that once a player is added, no matter whatever order other players are added after that, it has no effect at that player. So let's say in the first two orderings here, so once P1 is added, no matter how G1 and G2 are added after that, it wouldn't have any effect on the value added by P1, because that's how Shapley value was defined. So we don't need to actually consider that. So we basically just consider all the possible orderings of players before the ith player, and then we compute the value generated by the team without the player i and with the player i. And we check the difference of that and sum over that. And that's basically our value for that player. So this is how Shapley values work. And now like trying to integrate it to machine learning. So if we think of each of our features as a player, which is working to, together, with, together in a model to generate a model output, and we can consider the model's output to be the total team value that is being generated by all the features together. So in that case, Shapley value will give us how much each feature is contributing towards our model's output. So last year at NIPS, uh, Lundberg and Lee presented this paper called uh, A Unified Approach to Interpreting Model Predictions, in which they uh, gave the concept of Shapley additive explanations. So this basically combines the concept of Shapley values with a few other model explanation methods. And it basically computes a score for each feature on each data point about how much is it contributing towards moving that value from the expected value. And they also release a package called SHAP, which has been written in Python. And I'll be showing some exa examples on that next. So for example, let's take the case of uh, uh, XGBoost. So we are, let's say, so here we are importing, we load the visualization code, and we are trying to train uh, XGBoost to model on a Boston data set. So it's a normal training. 
and then we uh, give this model to the tree explainer of sharp and just do a simple sharp values this line computes the sharp values and then we can basically plot this thing uh, so here we are plotting just for the first data point in the training set so this is the output that we will get so here you can see there's the base value which is 22.34 that's basically the expected value over all the training data set the model output is the output that we get for that specific training set from our model and here are the features which are pt ratio l stat rm nox and the red shows like the red and blue plots show like which feature pushed the output towards which side so basically the red ones are pushing the output from base value towards the model output like in an increasing way so and the blue ones are pushing backwards so like negative towards negative from base value so here we can see like l stat was the major feature which made the output go from 22.34 to 24.41 so this is this plot is just for a single training point data point if we plot it for all our training data set so this plot is basically the horizontal version of this plot so you basically flip it 90 degrees counterclockwise and plot it for every single data point in your training set so that will give us this plot and from using this plot you can basically see which are the most affecting features in your data set and if you plot this in notebook uh, this plot is interactive here you can select like if you want to select a single feature you can just select a single feature and you can see how it's affecting the output of your model over the whole training set and from top you can even select how do you want to order these samples so we can also plot a summary plot using the sharp values so the summary plot is basically uh the sharp values of each feature over different training data points so if you see at the top feature l stat and the color is basically the feature value so a uh, red color means a higher feature value so if you check l stat and if your feature has a high value the sharp value is pretty low so basically you can think that the higher the value of l stat the more it's going to push the value of your model's output towards negative from your expected output so similarly you can check it for all the features that you have in your training set uh a simpler version of this is this plot which is also a summary plot but this plot basically computes the mean of uh, all the sh uh, shapely values over all the training data points and this basically gives you a simple view of which features affected your model output the most so l stat affects the output most then rm then crim so in this case uh, we saw a tree based method and shapely sharp the library has some uh, implementations of tree based methods and uh, deep learning methods which are really efficient to compute but it's not the case with all the other models but they have a kernel explainer which can basically explain the output of any model that you give it give to so here we are training our simple svm model on the iris data set and so basically to the kernel explain explainer we now uh, give the prediction probabilities which we get from sklearn uh, sorry and then we compute the sharp values one thing to uh, notice here is that you have to pass a parameter called n samples here which wasn't the case in when you did the tree explainer explainer this is because uh, if you think about the number of orderings that is possible for if you are considering all the possible orders in which you are adding the players it's going to be of the order of 2 to the power n which wouldn't be possible to compute in an exact way so sharp does a approximation here by sampling these orders and computing for those values and then approximating the sharp values for those and we can again plot this thing here we are plotting just for setosa because this is a classification problem last one was a regression problem and 
So here we can see again that uh, so the base value is at 0.32, but the output is at 0 0.01. And petal length is the main feature which contributed towards moving this value to 0 0.01. And if you do the same plot over the whole training data set, you can see that the petal length was the major fe feature which affected in the classification in total. And I'm done, actually. <laughs> yeah, thank you for listening. Any questions? Uh, thank you. Yes. Two questions. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, can you tell us quickly how this relates to, to Lime, which is basically taking the gradient? Both in, both in theory, because I have the hint, the idea that there is a theoretical relationship, and you know any practical, also empirically. Yeah, so, uh, so I think Lime is more of a local search kind of thing. So you basically take a training data point and you do a, like a linear model based on the, uh, at that data point, and then you predict b based on that. But uh, the shapely value basically combines that. So. Uh, if you read, check out the original paper, they basically say they combine like these seven methods, which I actually have a slide. Yeah, so they basically say they combine these seven methods, and for each model, they have like a different combination of these. And based on that, they so they actually do use Lime even for this explanation, but only for local data points. But for overall, they do some other stuff. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to read the paper then. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, thank you.